And good evening. We are live on YouTube, Twitch, and Twitter, but we want to make sure that we are live on Facebook as well. So we're going to bring in those groups and we'll get going. We got the Mile High Huddle and the Mile High Huddle podcast pages. I've been kicking back and watching the conversation in the chat for the last few minutes. My name is Scott Kennedy. I will be your host tonight. And the host will have a guest, not necessarily a guest. Zach Kelburn is on the way. He likes to gets here, take care of some other business on Sunday. So we get started a little late. He's like, hey, let's warm up the crowd a little bit. I'll be the opening act before the other football priest gets here. I'm Deacon Scott. I will be here tonight with Zach. Chad is out on location, so he will not be in. I'll be sitting in today and tomorrow, and then probably on Thursday, but we will see. Uh, welcome in, everybody. This is the Mile High Huddle Podcast. I have been enjoying the conversation, kind of as it's been going back and forth, back and forth about the same things that people have been talking about for a while now. The quarterback position and Bo Nix and his arm strength and can he be this, can he be that. Here's the thing about prospects, y'all. When you're talking recruiting, you're talking about NFL draft, nobody knows. Nobody knows. The most surefire of surefire things have failed and the longest of long shots have failed. Now, here's what I will do when I start going through this. I will tell you what I think, not what I know. And I'll say, this is where I would rank them, but I don't know how they're going to turn out. These are human beings. They are not Madden programs that have a number and a program next to their name. Oh, he's a 90. He's going to be better than the guy who's an 88. It doesn't work like that. So if you're going into an NFL draft saying, I know, you don't. You don't know. Uh, you know, I saw one, one, one point in here, you know, just someone said, I think BK finally said, it's just some players have higher odds to succeed. Yeah. Based on the traits, based on the tools, you start putting them in a certain order and you try and come up with a higher probability. And there is always a possibility of failure and the longest of long shots, Mr. Irrelevant himself could almost be a Super Bowl champion in his second year. So you just never know. So listen, I want to break down the show a little bit tonight, some of the things we're going to get into. Sean Payton is at the NFL annual meetings, and he has some things to say about the team building that they're doing, some of the guys they have targeted, why they have targeted them, what positions were important to them going into free agency, how they're still looking at the draft. Uh, there's some other things I wanted to get into. Bleacher Report had kind of a fun article today. They had the BS meter, and uh, they put some numbers on some guys, the BS meter of... Drake May is falling. Is that BS or not? The Broncos are targeting Bo Nix at 12. BS or not? All kinds of good things. One of the things I was also interested in was uh, Legereus Sneed and the new contract he got and what that might mean for one Pat Sertan. Because Legereus Sneed's contract was good. I don't think it's going to be, but maybe 70% of what Pat Sertan will end up getting on his next contract. So I want to say hello to some folks. We go live on the Mile High Huddle every single day because we want to have the conversation with you. We do downloads on podcasts as well. We get a lot of views after the fact, but we go live because we want to have the conversation with you. So I want to say hello to some folks that have come in already, like David McElrath. He says, good evening, Broncos country. Hashtag JJ McCarthy. Quarterback in there. And I saw Dylan Von Arks had a comment earlier. He says, you know, you're, you're kind of betting on upside with with uh, J.J. McCarthy. He's 21 years old, very toolsy. You're, you're looking to get what he is or what he – I'm sorry. <laughs> you're looking for what he could be, not necessarily what he is. And, you know, my comment on that is that's all of them. That's all of the guys are. Now, some guys are a little bit closer to the finished product than others. But when you're talking about college players, you expect all of them to get better as they progress unless they are just not good enough, which is, frankly, the vast majority of quarterbacks drafted. They're just not good enough, and they end up not making it. What do you get? Two, maybe two a class? You got guys that are playing 15 years now? That's uh, If you get two a class for 15 years, there's your starters. <laughs> there's, there's all 30 of them. Across the, across the NFL. So it's hard. You're talking maybe four or five guys in the first round this year. Could be another class of 83. That's always the go-to class for me is the, the class of 83. You can go 
uh, NFL draft class 83 and, and look at the quarterbacks who are in that one, you'll, you'll recognize some of those names. Appreciate you coming in, David. Um, and JJ McCarthy, we'll see, you know, the, the talk there is that he's, he's worked his way up into the top five and the Minnesota Vikings could be the team that want to move up into the top four. Arizona Cardinals have said, we are open for business. It does not make any sense to me for the other three to move out of the three spots because they need quarterbacks also, but someone might be able to pry away number four from the Arizona Cardinals. How expensive would that be? You got to figure three first round picks at least and change. Minnesota Vikings made a trade so that they picked up another first round pick in this draft. I think they're at 11 and 23. The Broncos are at 12 and don't have a second round pick. So the Vikings are in pretty good shape. They're already ahead of the Denver Broncos at 11. Now they have a 23. They throw in a 2025 number one. There's my three first round picks. The Denver Broncos don't have another first rounder. They don't have a second rounder. So they say, okay, here's number 12, which is worse than 11. Y'all can do math. Here's a 2025, which could end up being a really high pick. And now what? You want our 2026 one? Probably not. That's too far down the road. What else can we put in there to make this, this deal sweet? The Broncos really have one asset that would sweeten a deal like that. And his name's Pat Sertan. Here's two first round picks and Pat Sertan. Does that get us to number four where we can come in and get the fourth quarterback in this class? Is that worth it? I don't know, man. That's uh, that's expensive. I was really high on J.J. McCarthy at 12. Two first round picks and Pat Sertan for J.J. McCarthy. That scares me a little bit. That's that's an awful lot of potential good one superstar and two pretty good football players that I think I can get at 12 and next year's first rounder for sure. Scares me a little bit. Sam Bam, I haven't gotten a chance to say congratulations on your win of the raffle for February. So congratulations, man. I, I, I saw you as I compile all these. You know, you're hanging around like 12 and 13 for a long, long time. Then you get in, you come close, like as a nine seed. We're talking seeding here, like a CNCA tournament. Then you win it last month. I actually threw up a touchdown. I was, I was happy for you. I, I can't believe you beat GLP. Gary, Gary Leeds Palmer wins him every month. Doesn't matter what seed he is. He went from a, an outside dark horse like Gonzaga to being a, a, a perennial winner like Gonzaga. So good to see you, Sam, ma'am. He says, evening, Zach and Scott gonna do up the podcast while watching some March Madness. I had uh, Colorado beating Marquette today in my bracket. Almost pulled that upset. Anyhow, go Broncos. I'm, I put on, I went to Auburn. I put on the game in the background and watched them lose. I'm like, that's college basketball to me. I, I am not a fan of the formatting of college basketball. I think they do the absolute worst job of crowning the best teams. When you play a five-month season to get into a 60, 70 team, however many freaking teams are in it now with the play-ins and all that other stuff in a in a game that's as volatile as basketball with a hot shooting night turning into a single elimination tournament, it, it makes the entire sport meaningless to me as far as trying to watch and follow and, and care about it and have a vested interest in the game. Now, yeah, it's exciting. You know, yeah, the, the last second, the games are exciting, but I don't really know any of these teams and don't care anymore. And I've always said, people call it March Madness. I call it who gives a damn until March. Not my bag. I'm glad there's so many people enjoying it, though. Uh, it, is a, it is a big spectacle. So, Sam Bam, hope you're enjoying it. BK says, I'm looking forward to the topics tonight. Yeah, we'll, we'll try and mix it up a little bit. We can talk quarterbacks. If you all want to talk quarterbacks, we will talk quarterbacks. You know, this is, this is your show. A couple of the other things I wanted to... Um, to get into, uh, you know, Ian Rappaport told Daniel Mar Jeremiah on uh, over the weekend, he said he thought the Raiders were more likely to trade up for a quarterback than the Broncos. I'll have the Vikings in there too. Uh, Ian Rappaport said, uh, and this came from Andrew Mason, he quoted this stuff on Twix. He says, Sean Payton has won a lot with quarterbacks who are not as good as Jarrett Stidham. That got some blowback in there as far as, you know, like who? He's only had Drew Brees. I think Sean Payton went about 12 and three with uh, Taysom Hill, Teddy Bridgewater, and Jameis Winston. Jameis Winston played some of the best football of his life. Now, Jameis Winston has a number one overall pick type of arm, obviously. I mean, he went number one overall. 
he's he's got or at least top five. Some of these things start running together on me when I'm going live. So apologies. But he had a first round draft pick, toolsy quarterback, uh, threw for a ton of yards and touchdowns, just threw for a ton of interceptions too. Played much more under control, much more within a system. Taysom Hill it was a gadget. That one's interesting. And then Teddy Bridgewater was a former pro bowler who was not blessed with a lot of arm, but has a lot of, and never was, but had a ton of moxie. I watched Teddy Bridgewater play safety at, it was uh, it was the Elite 11 finals. They called it the opening. And it was a, a seven on seven tournament where before they started inviting individuals, they'd invite teams from around the country. And his Miami Northwestern team, I'm pretty sure that's where he went. It was a long time ago already. Went up to uh, went up to Oregon at Nike headquarters, and they won the thing. And Teddy played quarterback, and he played safety, and just got to watch him for two or three days. Just how he commanded the team, how he worked in on inner space, and just a phenomenal quarterback for those levels. You know, he, he wasn't the same as a pro. He didn't have all of those tools to it, but he was still pretty good. Guys made a lot of money in this game. And I say that because all of the good things about Teddy Bridgewater, I could say about Bo Nix for the most part as well, as far as, okay, this is a guy who knows how to move the football without having the biggest arm out there on the field. And Bo Nix probably has a better arm than Teddy did. Uh, not quite the athlete. Teddy was a, a little bit more, a little bit more of an athlete, but, but Teddy had moxie and leadership skills and all this type of stuff, all the stuff you can't measure and was a very successful quarterback up until he got his leg snapped and then it his his career trajectory took a hit then he goes to see to new orleans and goes five and oh as a starter and the carolina panthers who are a pretty good example of what not to do half the time gave him what you know 25 million dollars they gave him a huge contract you know teddy was a good seven eight million dollar uh quarterback after his injury good backup guy but, you know, there's again, there's a lot of conversation about Bo Nix. And I think one of the reasons that Broncos fans are talking so much about him is because he'll probably be the best of the rest. If the first four guys go in the top 10, the Broncos are outside of that group. Who can you get who can still w make you, who can still win football games for this team? And Bo Nix ends up being a logical answer for this. Tom Lockoff coming in. Good to see you, Tom. He says, the more. The more the days go by and more teams trying to trade up for a quarterback, I now think there might be five QBs before the Broncos pick a 12. My thoughts? I have a hard time seeing Bo Nix going top 10. I really do. And, and if you you see a lot of mock drafts with the Denver Broncos picking Bo Nix, you don't see anybody else taking Bo Nix before 12. And then if it's not Bo Nix at 12, if someone says, okay, the Broncos aren't taking Bo Nix. We're going to look in a different direction here and go with a, a best available prospect type of player. Then Bo Nix isn't usually in the first round at all. That that's kind of polarizing. Like you see it a lot. Some of the big names out there that are that are mocking. I've said it. I'm not a big name, but I agree with them. I said I can see Bo Nix going to the Denver Broncos at 12 because they desperately need a quarterback, and he can play. But if it's not the Broncos at 12 in those mocks, a lot of times he's not in the first round at all. So I don't, Tom, I don't think there will be five quarterbacks in the top 10. You could add 11 in there, I know. So in the elite 11 picks, I don't think that will happen. Um, so we'll see it. And part of that BS meter, the BS meter, I'll, the, uh, the there's a link on Bleacher Report I checked out on Broncos. The uh, let me see where it says the the they actually put in there. Let's rate the BS meter on the Denver Broncos going for Bo Nix at twelve. And the the Bleacher Report big board, Nix comes in at number eighty one overall. That's that's late third round on our big board. After five years of starting at Auburn and Oregon, Bleacher Report's Derek Klassen. Noted that Nix is, quote, still an incomplete player for someone who has played so much football. BS meter eight. They don't think there's any way Bo Nix goes to the Denver Broncos at 12. I disagree. I think he is a pretty good scheme fit for the Denver Broncos at 12. 
and he's got the credentials to be in the conversation as a first round pick quarterbacks get elevated. And if I've got a big need, what if let's say I, I've never seen, I haven't seen him as low as 81. That's for sure. But let's say he's at 40. Let's say he's at 27. I've seen him at 27. I think on NFL.com's or ESPN's big board, 27 is 27. Really that big of a reach for 12 when you desperately need a quarterback. Not for me. Now, 81 would be a huge reach. That would be too much. 50 might be too much. But if I've got a guy ranked as a late first and a desperate need at the guy at the most important position in football, and maybe in American sports, Zach, quarterback, what position is more important than quarterback in American sports? Nothing. I mean, point guard, no, because I can get a dominant center or, you know, I can do some other things. I can win a lot of games without a, a dominant point guard. You know, a center for that. Um, how about baseball? A number one pitcher once every five days. You know, I, that that you could have the best pitcher in baseball and not win a World Series because he only gets to throw a maximum of three times. You lose the other four games. Quarterback. It's it's arguably the most important position in American sports. I uh, appreciate you holding it down. Uh, <laughs> Welcome in, Zach. How you doing, man? <laughs> Just kind of slid right into MHH. Yeah. I appreciate you holding it down. I appreciate everyone's well wishes saying Zach is alive and everything. I, I kind of want to know what we're talking about here, Scott, so I can give my two cents. I assume trading up for a quarterback is on the menu. Here's one we were talking about was, um, you know, the idea that it's, it's a just – Bo Nix is very polarizing to, I'd say mostly to Broncos country because it's basically just the Denver Broncos that get linked to Bo Nix in the first round. Yeah. So there's a lot of people who rightly say, wait a minute, why, uh, why, why is it just us? Are we that desperate for a quarterback that we're going to go after a guy that nobody else is considering in the first round? Maybe. Or is it, you know, hey, he's a pretty good football player. So Bleach Report put out a BS meter. It was kind of a fun read. I, I will say that. And they're, they're Denver Broncos and Bo Nix being linked at 12. Let's put that up on the BS meter and, and see what it says. So they've got Nix at 81 overall. So they they put the BS meter at 8. They, they, they put it up there. 8 out of 10. This is high. No way is it going to happen. I disagree. Now, if you listen to Dub Valley Deep Divers, Eric Trickles, so he's talking to some folks connected to some NFL personnel. He says... There's no way there there's, he says, it's not happening. We'll see. It won't surprise me a bit. If the Denver Broncos were to select Bo Nix at 12 and it wouldn't surprise me if he was moderately successful early. I think a lot of people, Scott, are like putting too much emphasis on draft slotting, whether he's a first round talent or not, or whether he deserves to be a 12 or 19 or 20. If he can play, he can play. If Sean Payton thinks he's the guy, he's the guy. And if you feel that good about him in the first round, don't bother trading down and risking another team taking him like the Raiders at 13. If you like him, take him. And if you think he, he can be successful, it's all that matters. Doesn't matter, Scott, whether it's first round, second round, seventh round. If he's your guy, get your guy. Yeah, I want to check over Facebook here real quick. I'm, I'm actually going to hit something first. Some, sometimes we're like bulls here, and when we see red, it grabs our attention quickly. <laughs> quickly. You're flashing red. You got our attention, James. Thank you, James. We appreciate you in here coming in with a big red super chat, James, making the night for us already. He says, if we don't draft a quarterback at 12 or best available, what can we get for our pick at 12? I feel like there are only a handful of players we would take, but don't think we will. I think 12 is actually a pretty good spot, honestly. Um, when I'm doing mocks on the Falcons podcast at 8, I look at 11, 12, and 13 as possible trade-down positions because there's position players, especially if all these quarterbacks go. If four yeah. quarterbacks go and three wide receivers go, there's seven players right there. Then you go Joe Alt, there's eight. Brock Bowers can slip in there, there's nine. All of a sudden, I've got my pick of possibly the top cornerback. I've got my pick, the pick of the top edge rusher. Uh, and I've got a selection of a couple. There's three edge rushers that most people like in the, in the middle part, middle to upper part of the first round. There's two corners, three corners, really. Four corners, actually, now that I keep counting. Quinion Mitchell's a fourth. Cooper DeGene's in there. Terry on Arnold. Nate Wiggins. All those guys, if you're James, let's say you're the Detroit Lions. I, I 
I'm a lot. I like the Lions. I like Dan Campbell, and who doesn't like an underdog? They're a team that could be a shutdown defensive player, a shutdown cornerback away from the Super Bowl. It's not a stretch at all to think, hey, they dropped Pat Sertan in that defense. Could they be? Could they have beaten San Francisco 49ers last year? Yes, they could have. So maybe they're a trade up, and they're willing to trade you a second to to, uh, to send you a second round pick and a third rounder in 2025 to move up to to 12. You said the exact same thing I was going to say. It's not a great spot for quarterback needy teams like Denver, but if you want a corner or if you want an edge rusher, a tackle, some of the other skill positions, it's a great spot to be in. So the Broncos would have interest in terms of what they could get back. I would say it would net them, Scott, at least a second and a third, maybe depending on how, how high a team is coming up to 12, maybe even a future first. It's a good spot for them to be in if they're looking to trade down, but that's a big if as of now. So let me see here. Uh, Rodney Garcia, some questions in. I wanted to find uh, Keith's on Facebook. It's a little tough. Um, they scroll fast and they don't sh- they don't star automatically like like YouTube does. But Rodney says, "Hey Scott, do you think Denver has a chance to move up to nine in the first round?" Sure they do. Sure they do. The the if I'm, like I said, eight I think would be a good spot if if one of your guys falls for eight, but. You're not doing that until one of your guys falls there, until eight is on the clock. You're not doing that before the draft and not getting the quarterback you want. One of the, one of the problems I have is the, the you know, just the, the flat out, I trust the coaches thing. I trust Sean Payton to get his guy. Well, Sean Payton could be picking from the leftovers. You know, if it was to say, I've got Sean Payton to go out and recruit and he's going to hand pick and get his first choice. Yeah, I think that'd be a pretty good deal. But he's going to get who he can get. Not necessarily his first choice, maybe not his second choice, maybe not his third choice, maybe not even his fourth choice. Maybe his fifth choice. How can you trust a guy to say, yeah, his fifth choice is going to be banging? That, That doesn't compute for me. That doesn't make sense. So I don't trust him to get a quarterback in this draft that is going to be a 10-year franchise quarterback for the Denver Broncos. I don't trust that in anybody, really. But I don't trust the team picking 12 to be able to do that. There's a possibility, but the farther down the line you go, the probability slips. Yeah, I think you nailed it, uh, Scott. The only way you move up to nine or you start to think about moving up the top 10 is if the quarterback that you're coveting is ending is falling and you won't really know until draft night. He's not going to move up for, uh, you know, Bo Bo Nix or Michael Penix. He'd move up for Drake May if he fell. He'd move up for JJ. I'm assuming I'm speaking for Sean Payton if he fell. Um, But other than that, if those guys are off the board, if Minnesota jumps up and Bo Nix is probably going to be there at 12, you don't have to move up. You can save your assets, you know, stand, stand by and still get your guy uh this was the one that keith had early on he says god everyone is on bo nicks because that's the most likely available name near the top of the broncos yeah that's that's what i said lots of coverage is getting broncos country hyped and there's there's a lot to like there again the numbers are there size athleticism yeah. enough of an arm there's a lot to like just don't talk to any auburn fans about it that's all <laughs> no there's there's and again i, I could look at it the detractor in me would say Try and look at both sides, and it's usually somewhere down the middle. Again, the, the polarizing binary conversations, they, they're tiresome. There is no right and wrong when we're trying to predict the future. So stop saying it. This is. He is. No, he's not. Nobody is yet. Nobody's anything yet except prospects. So the best available probably, and there's a lot to like there. He's smart. He's a coach's kid. He'll, he's a, he is an absolute football rat. He's accurate as hell. He is a good athlete. He's been through multiple systems and succeeded and gotten better every single year. All good. Physically speaking, he's not ideal. Okay, well, I can come up with a lot of guys who weren't prototypes that have succeeded. But again, the better the tools with all of that other stuff, the higher the probability. 
The one thing I can tell Scott is that you're kind of sick of going through the same spiel. You've been doing this over and over for all these different type of podcasts, pitching Bo <laughs> Nix or pitching JJ. And there's so much uncertainty and we don't know until we know. So I think you're right. Bo Nix is not plan A in some people's minds. He's not plan B or C, but there's, I agree with Scott. He can fit in a Sean Payton system. And, and, Ultimately, at the end of the day, it only matters what Sean Payton thinks. So all this is uh, futile in a month from now if Sean Payton thinks he's the guy because he's taking him if he is. Yeah, and Michael Ronquillo's in here early. I can't find it just yet. He just says, good evening, Zach and Scott on the Mile High Huddle podcast. Go Broncos. Michael, I see you. Thanks for being here tonight, uh, as always. And Keith, thank you for the stars as well. Uh, we got Tom, wanted to make sure we saw Gary. Gary, speak of the devil and he shall appear. I was mentioning you earlier. I couldn't believe Mr. Lucky himself didn't win the uh, didn't win our jersey lottery for like the seventh consecutive year. Uh, I was actually starting, not that I don't love you, Gary, but I like to spread the love around a little bit. And I was like, wait a minute, we're up to three and Gary's still there. Gary's going to win it again. This thing's a bug. So, but I know Gary's happy for Sam Bam as well. Yeah. Uh, Gary says, hey, Scott. I don't see putting a proven quantity up to trade for a maybe. That is the road to insanity. I think they will trade back, go Broncos. So we're talking about, you know, the taking somebody like Pat Sertan to include him in a trade in order to get a prospect. It's scary. It is. It is. But the thing is, is I, I actually think people overvalue draft picks. Um, you know, when you start talking about, a proven commodity and what you can get for them. Typically you hear he's not worth that much of a draft pick, but I think, I think the general public overvalues them because of the hope. Yeah. Think what I could get with that pick. Well, likely you're not getting anything about half these guys wash out. And the farther down the line I get, the more probability is that they're not going to be memorable football players in the NFL. So I don't think the NFL values the draft picks as much as the general public to be honest with you it reminds me of that family guy meme where it's uh you know you could pick the boat or you could pick the mystery item and the mystery item can be anything it can even be a boat and you just <laughs> don't know and that's what makes the draft fun it's what makes it scary it's what gives a lot of people like you said scott perfectly hope but here's my counter gary is that ps2 is a sure thing we know how good he is one of if not the best corners in the game but how much of the broncos won with ps2 on the team you you need a quarterback by any means necessary point blank period if sean payton thinks that he can get his guy by dealing ps2 we kind of have to swallow that bullet it's not preferable not ideal i'd love to keep ps2 around but quarterback the guy who throws the ball scott will always be more important than the guy who's covering the ball yeah, we had the conversation, um, you know, last year about the first round pick for Sean Payton. Is it worth it? I'm like, there's there's very few draft picks in the history of this game that are more important than having the right coach. Now, yeah. I think a first the late first round draft pick, six months of Bradley Chubb was worth Sean Payton because that's what that ended up being. Speaking of, the NFL doesn't value picks as high as the general fan does. Mm -hmm. You got a first round pick for giving up six games of Bradley Chubb. Okay, thanks. Um, and then I, I traded that one for Sean Payton, which was well worth it. Because I, I asked at the time, like, what if, what if Sean Pat Sertan, as far as cost control and talent, has never and will never be as valuable to your team as he is right now. Yeah. And his value relative to what he's eating up in your resources will only get worse. Where have you been? How how has that helped you win a win a game? Now you know a Pro Bowl rookie quarterback contract. That's pretty damn valuable. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we'll see, Gary. I think I could see the Broncos pulling the trigger on something like this if they thought they could get into the top four. I could. I don't know if I'd have a hard time pulling that trigger. I'm a little more conservative than that. And uh, Loyal, the smoke and hustler, says, man, I don't care, or something along those lines. Just get me a quarterback at 12. I'm sick of it. Sick of it. I think you can get a quarterback at 12. I think, I think Bo Nix will be available at 12. If that's your guy, that's your guy. You don't trade down. You do not. If, if you like Bo Nix, you draft him. You don't risk not getting your quarterback. Oh, I really liked him, but 
We were hoping we could get him at 20. Well, crap. Now we don't have a quarterback. Yeah. Um, now, now we're going in with Jarrett Stidham. I don't mean to be that disrespectful to Jarrett Stidham, but to me, Jarrett Stidham is not the future of the Denver Broncos. I'm, I'm, I'm glad, Scott, that more people are coming around to kind of the quarterback or bust mentality. I'm not advocating for the Broncos to take a quarterback they're not comfortable with or uh, take one to take one, but it all starts and ends there. The buck stops at quarterback, and this is why Sean Payton was hired. He wanted a chance to pick his own guy. Well, go get his guy. Day one, quarterback or nothing. David comes back in. He says, let's say the Broncos draft Knicks. Do you start sit him or does the rookie beat him out? Just a thought. You answered your own question there, David. If the rookie beats him out, the rookie plays. Yeah. that That's the way it goes. So uh, insert name here. I don't care who, is, who it is, but let's say it's Knicks in the first round. The first round guy is going to get more of a chance. It's just the nature of the beast. You know, the scholarship players get preferential treatment over the walk-ons. The first round picks get more opportunities than the fifth round picks. It's just the way it is. But if Bo Nix is playing at a capable level and you think he is the future of your team, you play him. If J.J. McCarthy is playing at a level where you think you're not going to stunt his growth by putting him out there and basically getting him shell-shocked, you play him. So there was another, same in that same article, Zach. This is one of those, if you can't laugh, you cry one of kind of things. There was a one-word answer, like let's sum up every team's offseason and, and their their future prospects for for with one word. And uh, for Denver Broncos, it was usually it was like one word and then an explanation. For the Denver Broncos on on Bleacher, it said sacrificial. Twenty twenty five says thank you. So if I'm not sacrificed, if I'm worried about getting somebody like shell shock back there, I'm going to use my backup guy who's happy to have a paycheck. I'm not going to use my rookie back there and have damaged goods. But if I'm playing competent football, even if it's not winning football, but I'm playing competent football, I want, I want my guy to get reps. This whole, well, you should sit Jordan Love for three years. Look how good he was in his fourth year. Think of how good he'd be in his fourth year if he'd been playing for three years. Now, you are more ready to play right away. If you sit for three years, you're more, your first year will be better. But that's your fourth year. If it was your four, if your fourth year was your fourth year as a starter, I'm feeling Jordan Love would have been even better in his fourth year as a pro. I don't, I don't buy it as far as this blanket statement that we should draft him and sit him. One size does not fit all. Play him, David. If he can play, you play him. I was going to say there's this overwhelming sentiment in Broncos country that Stidham st should start regardless. He should be the week one starter and the, and the rookie should be the backup. If Stidham is vastly outperforming the rookie or if the rookie's not ready, like Scott was talking about, fine. But if the rookie is showing like he's ahead of Stidham or he's going to get it over the course of the season, the only way he's going to develop is by getting reps, getting action, good or bad, is being on the field. That's how players learn best, not in the classroom or sitting behind someone else on the bench. You mentioned Jordan Love, and that's appropriate. You've got to get him on the field sooner than later. And if he's ready, he's going to play. Lawrence says, what's up, guys? I don't trust the hype. I think a lot of these QBs would be picked in the fourth round if so many teams didn't need a quarterback. Look at the draft decline. Uh, quarterbacks get elevated because, again, it is the most important position. So, you know, I, I, if we're talking like pure talent, is there anybody out there that's better than Brock Bowers and Marvin Harrison Jr. or Malik Neighbors? Maybe. You know, maybe not. But it, it is, again, it's the most important position in sports, so you've got to take your shots at it. Uh, as far as being picked in the fourth round and guys that don't live up to the hype, Lawrence, that's not just the quarterback's brother. That, that's all of them. Half the guys drafted in the first round are going to end up being Jags. It's just the way it is. Um, Want to go here. Let's just run through this here real quick. I'm not sure how many of these guys had their fifth year options picked up, but you know, the 2021, those are the guys that are next on deck for having their fifth year options picked up. One, Trevor Lawrence, yes. Zach Wilson, no. Trey Lance, no. Kyle Pitts, yes. Jamar Chase, yes. Jalen Waddle, yes. Penny Sewell, yes. J.C. Horn, I don't know. Pat Sertan, yes. Devontae Smith, yes. Justin Fields, no. Micah Parsons, yes. Rashawn Slater, probably. Uh, Mac Jones, no. Zayvon Collins, I would think not. 
Jalen Phillips, I, I don't know, but I don't think so. Kadarius Tony, no. Quiddy Pay, maybe. Caleb Farley, no. Darisaw, Najee Harris, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of no's in there. Those are guys that just, they're not worth the fifth year on their contract that, that would be guaranteed to them. Let's just let them go. Let's, let's try and re-sign them. So the bus label is not reserved for just quarterbacks, Lawrence. And Lawrence, you might be right if teams didn't need a quarterback, but the reality is teams do need quarterbacks, and there's always that premium that teams pay for quarterbacks. It's the reason why Knicks is probably going to be a first-rounder. JJ is going to be a first-rounder. Michael Penix could be a first-rounder. They always get overdrafted because, like Scott was talking about, the position is so valuable and so important. And, and it really goes to show you how bad that class was two years ago when Kenny Pickett is the only first-round pick and there wasn't one taken in the second round. And if you don't remember, Malik Willis was getting shouts of being drafted in the top five. What do you go, fourth round? Yeah. End of the third? Because of the tools? Because of the excitement? At the Senior Bowl, he, he was like, wow, look at him run. Look at him run. Make him a running back. He can't hit the broad side of a barn. You know, so... We'll see. These guys do get hyped up again, um, and there's people with legitimate sources out there. I tend to trust, but it was funny. Last year, there was a hit and a miss. If you talk to any SEC football fan, including their own teams, Kentucky and Florida, they could not believe Anthony Richardson and Will Levis were being talked about as top 10 picks. Anthony Richardson went four, and he looked better as a passer in his first four games with Indianapolis than he ever did with the Florida Gators. And then Will Levis slid. Will Levis did slide. He ended up, um, I think, first pick of the second round, if I'm not mistaken. He did slide, but he was getting shouts for top three. He fell to the second round. Who could be that guy? I would, again, I would love for the Denver Broncos to be able to trade down and get Bo Nix and back, back into the first and get another at least – another day to pick because the second round is fun this year. Every time we do a mock, you're like, Oh, I'd love I, yeah, crack. Exactly. No second round pick. I would, that would be so awesome to get your quarterback and get a second round pick would be a lot. That is the best scenario for me. It's the best scenario, but listen, if you have win that a team uh, behind you, like the Raiders again at 13 might take Knicks. If you trade down, then just stay at 12 and take Bo Knicks. It's simple, Scott. Yep. If you, again, if you're not sold on him, then you trade down. If you are, yeah, pick him. There's no, no questions. No questions asked. Or I think I just started talking Legereus Sneed's contract, Zach, about what he had just gotten. Did you see his deal? I did and, not. Get uh, what was your reaction as regards to Pat Sertan? Did I you did see not his get... deal. No, it's four years, seventy-six million, with fifty-five guaranteed. So it ends up in in reality being a three-year, fifty-five million dollar contract. Three goes into fifty-five, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen times close yeah. nineteen. So three years, nineteen million dollars a year guaranteed. For Legereus Sneed, where does that put Pat Sertan next year? It puts him at the top of the list to get paid. And he's going to want a lot of money. And he even tweeted about something like that. And I uh, retweeted it. He put the money bag symbol. And Scott, it's not the first time. I mean, he obviously wants his due and he deserves it. And it's not going to come easy or, I mean, or come cheap. And that's why you have to consider it's part of the calculus here. No one wants to trade PS2. But if you do, you're, you're going to have, you're getting out of having to pay him what's going to be one of the richest defensive contracts in league history. Do you do that at this time? Yeah, it's it's gonna be the the richest defensive back for sure. Yeah. Um he's he's I think he's gonna be a hundred million dollar guy. Yeah. I can see I can see what whatever the numbers are, 180 million dollars, you know, whatever. I, I think it ends up being, you know, just like I said, hopefully all a lot of y'all have watched me enough to say how to how to actually look at what contracts are. Take the average, divide that into the guaranteed, and that's how you get the duration. So Legarius needs is four years, seventy six million dollars. That comes out to what, 19 a year? Okay. 
19 into 55 goes three times. So three years at $19 million, it's really a three-year $55 million contract, 19 per year, somewhere in that. I think his guaranteed money is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of $100 million. Four years, $100 million. And it may be a six-year contract for $150 million with 100 guaranteed. That ends up being a four-year deal at 25 per. Won't surprise me a bit. Now, though, if you don't plan on trading him, Scott, do you pay him right away and get that contract in the books before that market value keeps rising? Um, it, the, the Denver Broncos would have the most reason to to pay him. His fifth year option is going to be as a cornerback. His fifth year option twenty mil, I think, right? It's twenty. Yep, it's twenty. I can actually lower his cap number. I can lower his cap number from twenty by getting him a four year you know, a six year, $150 million deal with a hundred guaranteed. I, I could lower that cap number. Yeah. Do the math on, we're not going to do the math today, but you could. And, but the thing is, is by the time you need it to hit coming out, it's 2025. You'll, you'll have money. I can lower his cap number for 2025. And then in 2026, I've got lots of space where I can start easing that number back up. And hopefully I should have some more room. Speaking of draft picks, the Denver Broncos announced their order has shifted up a little bit. So wanted to show that screen on here, and hopefully you can see this. Uh, the blue is the round, and the orange is the pick. So they picked 12, 76, 121, 136, 145, 147, 2003, 2000, and 2000, Scott. These aren't years. 207 and 203. So three fifth round picks in there, lots of late day threes in there, 136, 145, et cetera, et cetera. So more of them in there. Zach, what, what are your first thoughts when you you see the, the quantity on there? My first thought is uh, wishful thinking that it could be used as ammo in a trade-up. That's could be the reason why they got Jerry Judy gone and collected those mid-rounders was to package that, to move up for a quarterback. If not... The Broncos need so many different roster holes filled in the draft, Scott, that you can use those mid-rounders on an inside linebacker or a safety or a corner. So regardless, there's no such thing as having too much draft uh, draft capital. Yeah, there's there's a team that I, I want to show you all. My connection to StreamYard is just kind of skitzed out, so hopefully we're still good here. So looking at that, I see six picks, 121 and later. Okay, well, what's that worth? Now, this could be the exception and not the rule, but here's the Los Angeles Rams last year and their picks, okay? They had one, two, three, four. I already counted it. It's 11. They had 11 picks after 121. 128 and later, they had 11 picks, including quarterback Stetson Bennett, including his zero games played. Those 11 players averaged 10 games played for the LA Rams, picked 121 or later, 128. So yes, I can find depth. I can find contributors yeah. if I take enough shots. Now, Zach, you cover the Denver Broncos. How many picks did they have last year that were in this range, like 150 and later? I don't remember many. Yeah, two. How many games did they play last year? Over two games. JL Skinner got in two games. Mm -hmm. Alex Forsyth got in zero. So don't poo poo these late round picks just because you haven't seen them with the Denver Broncos. If I take enough shots, again, the probability, we talk about value, my probability of getting an impact player in later rounds is smaller. My probability increases with every time I take a shot. So if I have three, first, three fifth round picks and I've got a one in three chance of getting a player, guess what? My chances of getting a player are like 90% if I get three hacks at the three hacks at it. So again, I like that. They, they've made some moves to try and get some, you know, developmental interior lineman let's get a let's get a tackle let's get an offensive tackle that moves really well but he's 20 pounds underweight you know there's flawed players at the at the premium positions 
uh, at that late. But, you know, when you're shopping in the fifth round, if I take three of those flawed players, one of them's gonna one of them's gonna hit. Whoa, Scott, asking the Broncos to draft a tackle is a, a pretty I know wishful thinking no. to say the least. I'm I'm gonna do that one day. I'm gonna go through every team since what 2017 and see if the Denver Broncos are the only team in <laughs> football they gotta be. that haven't dropped because my gut tells me they are. They have to be. They, they, there cannot be another <laughs> team. 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, that's gone six years without drafting an offensive tackle. That is astounding to me. And the good thing is about George Payton, you know, love him or hate him, he he is good at finding middle to later round talent in the draft. So the Broncos have more of those dart throws, a.k.a. more chances to fill out the roster. And like Scott was saying, you could find impact players there. Might not be a pro bowler or an all pro, but you can find players that could contribute in 2024. Lawrence says the Broncos need to stand on their own pick for once. The miracle player isn't going to happen. We only end up trading him for a fourth and a fifth round pick. So, you know, I'm not sure if you're talking about you know, stop trading away these guys that you get. Don't stop trading away Von Miller and Bradley Chubb and Jerry Judy and Noah Fant, guys that you take high. Lawrence, one of the things that might not sound fair to you, but is a reality in the NFL is these guys have contracts. And when their contract runs out, they have choices. And their choice might not be to stay with the Denver Broncos when their contract runs out. So you make a move in order to try and get something instead of nothing. With Jerry Judy, don't get the feeling he really wanted to stay around much longer. And his $13 million helped me get a new safety. Helped me uh, help me eat Russell Wilson's contract and I'll get out from under that. Justin Simmons, same thing. About a $16 million savings. Older guy. Unfortunately, you didn't get anything and a, a pick for him, but you're getting a lot of money back. You know, and that money can be used to get more players that you need. You got, is Brandon Jones going to be that much of a downgrade on Justin Simmons? This is a load of questions, Zach. Because he could be an upgrade. You never know. Mm. He's a third of the price. Yeah. I mean, I think it's the, I would do the opposite if I'm a GM, Scott. I wouldn't keep a player around just because of their draft pedigree. You can either perform or or you're out the door. And they showed that with Jerry Judy. Bill Belichick during his Patriot glory days showed that. He cut high-priced talent or pro Bowl talent because they weren't performing anymore. And if you look over, Scott, the list of available free agents even today, former pro bowler, former all pro, former first round pick. I mean, it's littered with that and they're good when they're good and they're not when they're not. And you have to move on and you can't stick with someone because just they were a first round draft. In my it opinion, is a, it is a tough sport. It's not that not necessarily the age. It's the mileage yeah. of, of where you can start getting beat up. Now I titled this show about Sean Payton break silence and the Broncos off season move. So I guess I ought to read kind of what he said. On here, but he had an interview with Broncos media, and he was talking about the the, the players that they chose, specifically Brandon Jones and uh, and the defensive tackle Roach. Says, the important thing is the vision. I paraphrase this one a little bit. The important thing is the vision statement that we have, their strength, their weaknesses. We spent a lot of time targeting certain players. We wanted to find the exact fit for the positions. Safety was a must. A defensive tackle. He didn't say that was a must, but that it was important. And we'll keep monitoring as we head into the draft. He says, everything's still on the table for a quarterback. We're in the midst of draft preparation. Again, I don't know. I don't know if it's ignorance or just dishonesty. When these people start writing up about, they're so shocked that Denver Broncos weren't more players in free agency yeah. for, you know, a veteran quarterback in, in, in for the team. They got one. They got him last year. They, they paid him for two years. His name's Jared Stidham. <laughs> if Jared Stidham had started the last five games for the Denver Broncos this year and you signed him this offseason, everybody would say, hey, that's who the Denver Broncos got to be their bridge quarterback. Well, that's who the Broncos got to be their bridge quarterback. <laughs> Jared Stidham. They're not in the market for a free agent. It, it's baffling to me. 
I guess it's ignorance too, Scott, because even George Payton told you at the combine, he said, listen, we're not going to be shopping from the upper tier in the grocery aisle. We're going to be shopping in the clearance rack and trying to save a few pennies. That's why you saw the Brandon Jonesons and the Malcolm Roaches of the world. And they put in, they were never as big into the Darnolds and the quarterback derbies. That was more of a media creation. They had a number, Scott. We don't know what that number is, but uh, apparently Sam Darnold at $10 million crossed that line. They were never going to be big players, nor should they have. Have been yeah i don't want to spend 10 million dollars on sam darnold Mm-mm. i don't want to spend six on marcus mariota Mm-mm. uh who else who else was in that you know joe flacco maybe but is joe flacco gonna win you more games are you all of a sudden a playoff contender because you signed joe flacco no he's a perfect backup to anthony richardson he that's a great pick for the for the indianapolis colts it makes zero sense you need a sacrificial lamb this year if you're bringing somebody in for as a as as an outsider Jared Stidham is still young enough that hey maybe he does have some upside I'd like to find out I'm not going to I'm not going to bring in a 35 year old the uh, Lincoln Ryan Tannehill why are you bringing in Ryan Tannehill why what what are you trying to what are you trying to do that you don't think you can get from Jared Stidham that you're going to get out of Ryan Tannehill I'm going to go beat the Chiefs twice and win the West cuz I got Ryan Tannehill <laughs> nope. no no doesn't make any sense to me. Save that cap space. Roll it over. Preaching to the choir here. <laughs> that I know that to the to uh to the your football priests. I get it. Um let's see. Oh, the other thing he talked about a little bit was uh, you know, the NFLPA giving high marks to the Denver Broncos, which is very cool because when the Denver Broncos put out the flag that they're ready to win again, it will be easier to recruit guys. Yeah. It will. And and again, this year you signal when you cut Justin Simmons, when you trade Jerry Judy, when you release Russell Wilson, you're not going to be even if you had free, if you, even if you had more money, you're still the only guys you're going to get. You're going to have to pay too much for. You're you're not going to outbid, you know, the Pittsburgh Steelers, the Kansas City Chiefs, the Buffalo Bills, dollar for dollar. You're not going to win that if they offer him a million and I offer you a million. You're not going to win that right now. You're gonna have to offer them a million five. Yeah. You're gonna have to you're gonna have to pay more for those guys. One year to get out of cap hell, get your quarterback. You got more money in 2025, and you're freaking loaded in 2026. But this draft is so important. It is so important to, to maximize your picks and get some good young players into the into this. I say the system, but into Dove Valley. I think it's the difference, Scott, between competing in 2025 or maybe even as soon as 2024 if you hit on the quarterback and competing in 2027 and 2028, as Mike Cliss was joking about. If they nail it, they get like the Texans, for example. If they can knock it out of the park, they can be competitive sooner than we thought. If not, ooh, it's going to be a long, uh, multiple set of winters in Denver. Phil, it feels like a newer name, but I like this one. Uh, the the Corno in your name. The C is Spencer Rattler. I like Spencer Rattler. Uh, you know, if you're sitting there in the third round, you didn't get your quarterback and Spencer Rattler's right there. That's not a bad pick in the third. And it puts you back in the market again. You probably drafting a quarterback, targeting a quarterback again. But maybe Spencer Rattler comes in and play, plays lights out. I like Spencer Rattler. I don't think the, dif- the distance between... I, I think he should be in the same conversation with Bo Nix and Michael Penix for me as that next tier of quarterbacks. So I do... Uh, I do like that pick. We are uh, we're getting close here. We're at 53 minutes. So if you got any dying urges, people are talking hand size and shoe sizes now. So we are getting into the weeds of the NFL draft. So I don't know. I, I measured it once. I forgot. It's like nine and a half from. I can palm a basketball with my left hand. It's bigger than my right hand, though. Kind of strange. So I, I can palm a basketball. Big hands, little feet. Only ten and a half for being six one. I bet Skater Mike has smaller feet to get on that board. Or do you need big feet on the board? I would think smaller feet. Help me out with that, Skater Mike. I never skated, scouted skaters. Imagine if we drafted new O-line, trade down our first pick for more picks, just drafted offensive line, and have the best light of league, then draft a quarterback next year. I, it can make sense. Are, do you reach? Let's say you know you don't really love any of the quarterbacks. And why even trade down? The best prospect could be a really, really good franchise left tackle. Yep. 
to come in. I'll play him. I'll play him somewhere else. I can play him at guard. I can do whatever. I can make him my swing tackle. I can move on from bowls. I could. Well, you see, the thing is, is you just committed to McGlinchey again. You're uh, you kind of moved his clock back a year, uh, where you're committed to him for two more years instead of just one more year. But Bowles is in the last year of his contract and is movable. Okay, let me get my tackle for the next 10 years. I only draft him every 10 years anyway, so why not this year? <laughs> uh, yeah, the Broncos, Scott, really like Joe Waltz. I'm sure you talked about that, or you, I'm sure you heard about that. You saw the video of Zach Sharif working him out. And that's what I was saying, Skater Mike, the last couple weeks. Now, you can throw a dart and hit a Broncos need. If not quarterback, then tackle or front seven, you know, inside linebacker, safety corner. I would not mind if they went and fortified the trenches. It's something the Lions did. It's something that 49ers did they kind of built from the uh the inside out I wouldn't hate it I prefer QB but if they want to go O-line there I wouldn't cry Todd Ostendorf says what tight end can we expect in the middle rounds that could be a contributor right away the bar set pretty low brother that, that's part of it you know when you're you're trying to beat out Adam Troutman and you know <laughs> and Greg Dulcich takes himself out of the race you know I like Theo Johnson a lot you know, yeah. six six, two hundred and sixty pounds guy with a RAS, a relative athletic RAS, with a relative athletic score that it's almost a perfect ten. Um, I, I love that number. They basically just compare everybody to everybody else. It's RAS dot football, and you can plug in any name. And his score is a perfect ten. Uh, forty inch vertical leap or something crazy. Forty and a half inch vertical leap at six six two sixty. Theo Johnson on a Penn State is I can't help but draft him every single time. When I'm in the 120s in my mock drafts, I take him every single time. He's got to be a late third guy with that yeah. type of with those uh, with those measurables, and he can catch. He was at the Senior Bowl. He looked good. And that argument, Scott, and I fully agree. I would love a middle round pick on Johnson. That's why I wouldn't go Bowers at 12. That's a trendy pick right now in Broncos country, but it would be the ultimate luxury move for a team that can ill afford that. So let me see here. Rodney asks, he says, if, if Brock Bowers is there at 12, do you take him? What's interesting is one of the bigger names was Field Yates or Daniel Jeremiah. I don't think it was Kuiper because I think Kuiper had Bo Nix, but said Brock Bowers. And he said, the commentary was, I know tight end's not a big need for the Denver Broncos. And, you know, my rock eyebrow went up. I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> it's absolutely a need for the Broncos. A tight end is arguably the one of the biggest needs for the Broncos. Now, it's not a hugely impactful position, so you don't think about it as much. But I'm going out there with Adam Troutman and Greg Dulcich. You know, Troutman's a vet minimum guy, and Dulcich has played 15 minutes in his two years. Yeah. So, you know, I think he tweaked a hamstring. Just, you know, I, I'm not going to bag on him. He's You can't count on him. He's been injured. He's been injured. You need a tight end. Yeah. So Brock Bowers at 12, I don't know. For me, it's quarterback or I'd love to move down. Move down a few spots um, and get get a second rounder. You know, I, I would say I, I would I'd rather have I'd probably rather have two seconds than uh, number 12 right now, honestly, for this team. And if I could throw in another third, two seconds and next year's third round. I might rather have that. Uh, but at Bowers, do I take him? Probably not because I want to I want a player at a more financially viable position. What do I mean by that? Is when you draft a tight end that high, it's based on like average salaries and stuff. You're not getting any benefits on his contract. That he automatically becomes one of the 10 highest paid tight ends in the league. You're not getting any benefit of a rookie contract. It doesn't matter if he turns into Travis Kelsey or George Kittle. Yeah. But again, you're trying to limit your risks and maximize probability. That's all you're doing in the uncertainty of what is a science, art, gut feel, crap shoot of the NFL draft and constructing your roster, Rodney. I would also prefer a player, Scott, that has a, a position they play is a little more transfer friendly to the NFL. Tight ends in my experience, rarely out of the box are they superstar. 
And, you know, Eric Ebron comes to mind, for example. I wouldn't want to gamble and use that. And um, Jeremy Sean in the comments says it best. A tight end of 12 is like putting a $3,000 front door on a mobile home. It's like, okay, you have the shiny tight end, Scott and Bowers. Who's throwing him the ball? Jared Stidham? It defeats the purpose to me. Yeah, I had all those conversations. Patrick, good to see you. Thanks for keeping me caffeinated, keeping all of us caffeinated. I had, I had the same conversation, y'all, three years ago, 2021, with the Atlanta Falcons. I had a creaky quarterback, a sieve of an offensive line, a non-existent defense, a couple pretty good wide receivers already, and you're you're taking a tight end at four? <laughs> really? I'm going to burn through his rookie contract before you have any idea what you're going to do at quarterback. They did. Yeah. Three years of Kyle Pitts, and you're like, okay, what happened to Kyle Pitts? The Atlanta Falcons. That's what happened to him. So good to see you, my friend. Uh, Patrick, I think we are just about done. I was looking for, did I start that comment? Because I wanted to show Michael to get us out of here. I did. Look at that. 60 on the dot right there. Michael Ronquillo, sunset today. We'll see you tomorrow morning, Michael. He says, great show, Zach and Scott on the Mile High Huddle podcast. Go Broncos. Zach, why don't you, why don't you, you know, show up late and get us out early? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say it's more of a credit to uh, Scott tonight, Michael, but appreciate it as always. I'm going to assume it was a tremendous episode of the Mile High Huddle podcast. Uh, if you're not doing so, please follow us on Twitter at the MHH pod. You can follow the main account on Twitter at Mile High Huddle. Uh, Scott is at Scout Kennedy. I'm at Kelberman NFL. If you guys want some merch like we're rocking each and every podcast, check out MHHmerch.com and get you some. If you haven't, please drop us a like at Facebook.com slash Mile High Huddle pod. You can find us on Instagram at Mile underscore high underscore huddle. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, make sure you're leaving your football priest and our Deacon Scott a five-star review for a chance to win some merch each and every single month. But if anything, y'all, please subscribe, like, and share this video and every video you see on the MHH channel. It really helps us grow and reach more Broncos fans just like you. I missed unique prepping. I apologize. He says, I hope we get J.J. McCarthy or Bo Nix, then we have Stidham as his developer. Sean Payton's his developer. You know, that, that's the yeah. that's the kind of thing. I, I I think that's a little overrated. Now, it's always good to have your peers and that type of stuff, but I'm much more important than having the right quarterback coach, the, the, mo the, the guy in there who's putting a system in place. I don't – you saw what it was like when Vic Fangio was your head coach. Did it matter who your, who was in the quarterback room? Not really. It, it, it didn't. Uh, I've already forgotten that offensive coordinator's name. With Fa Pat Shermer? Yes, Shermer. Uh, you know, you're smart it, to it, forget. It didn't really matter, you know, who the who the other quarterback was. It, it, it was they were doomed to fail. Teddy Bridgewater is one of the best backup quarterback mentors there is. Didn't really help, unfortunately. You know, that's so unique prep, and I, I get it here, but I could just say I hope we get JJ or Nick's full stop. I think that's what you're going for. Apologies. I missed that a little bit earlier. I want to say thank you to our super chat superstars like Michael, 69 Skater Mike, Lawrence coming in a couple of times, David Yunkin a few times, Keith Brugman, Loyal, that smoking hustler. How do you forget a name like that? Gary Palmer, Tom Lockoff, BK, Sam Bam, and his, uh, his new jersey, David McElrath breaking the ice, and of course, the red hot James Moss. Thank you tipping the show for us. Thank you so much. Keeps the lights on. Keeps his forehead bright and shiny. Keeps us in. We'll see you tomorrow, Zach. We got a little buzzer beater here. We got Deanna, Lady D, $10 super at the buzzer. Late, but have a great night. Good to see you, Deanna. We hope you can go back and listen to the pod tonight. We're just about wrapping up. We'll be back on tomorrow, though. Scott and I, tomorrow night. Have a great rest of your Sunday. Uh, BFB tomorrow or no, Scott? Yes, Broncos for breakfast on Monday go. and Thursdays for the near future. There you go. Check that out tomorrow morning. We'll see you tomorrow night. Take care, and as always, go Broncos.